What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to an all-new episode of Tatro Talks. Happy to be with you here on another Tuesday morning for me, perhaps afternoon for you, perhaps Wednesday for you, who knows, depending on where you are in the world. But welcome. Welcome to the stream. We got another call-in show today. I already have people lining up in the waiting room, so if you haven't yet, use the Zoom link in the chat. I just put it there. And... Um, get ready to call in. I want to talk all about like monetization and revenue generating um, ways you can make money as a home studio music producer today. It would be great to get into some conversations about that. I can share a little bit of what I know. Folks can share what they know or ask questions about like ways that they can make money as a home studio music producer. It'd be an interesting conversation to have. Hey, if you're new here though, my name is Tatro. I'm an electronic music producer. I make uh, electronic music uh, tutorials, live sessions, um, and do community stuff like this. I do live streams every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. We'll be streaming again later tonight. Today's show is brought to you by 343 Labs. If you don't know, 343 Labs just put out a whole is putting out a whole video manual for Ableton Live 11, um, and it's completely free. So you can check that out 343labs.com/handbook, and it's an entire handbook comprehensive on live 11 we're rolling it out slowly but there's a few chapters already up i highly suggest you take advantage we also stream every single day on youtube.com slash 343 labs um and you should check out some of the other streams because we have streams taught by um uh ableton certified trainers um folks that have spent a lot a lot of time in the music industry that also happen to be 343 labs instructors so if anybody's trying to go super deep in learning about synthesis and sound design ableton live logic um, all levels of those too. Um, you should definitely check out the for labscom to check out the offerings, but at the very least we are almost at 9,000 subscribers on three, four, three labs channel. So if you open another tab real quick, if you're on my channel, go to youtube.com slash three, four, three labs, hit the subscribe button because there is lots of cool videos there. I have some videos up over there. Um, and we're live every day. You will not miss it. You will not regret it is what I'm trying to say, but Hey, welcome everybody. I see some folks in the chat. What is good, my friends? Justin McCaffrey says, bruh, I'm wondering what, what did I do wrong? I want to say hello to Ben C, Niles FN, SDK. Shout out to all the members, by the way. We're on the road to 100 members. I'm not sure what the actual count is, though. So shout out to members real quick. Taylor Deemer, Zen, Samuel Messiah, Loic, Arturo, Zen, Eternal Wolf. Uh, who did I miss? We got SDK. We got Loic. Cool. And then everybody else. What's up? Beats by Ted. Uh, June Bernie, Ray Calvin, Nova. I've got Restream bot in here that's telling me all the people that are watching over on other platforms. Uh, so what's up, Justin Gill over on Twitch? Hello. Um, the Zoom link is in my YouTube chat, by the way. So that's where it is. If you are looking for it, we'd love to get you on the air so we can chat about things. Nova Beats is here. Um, who else do I see? Adrian Vasquez, Furkan, what's up? My mom is here in the chat, hello. Um, 343 Labs is in the chat. What do you know about that? Yata Aditya is what I want to say. Hello. Beisha is here. What's up, Beisha? Robin. Robin says, I'm in school, but I'll call in in a few minutes after it's over. I was here last time. Great. Good to know, Robin. It's Harsh is here. Prod by Yarko. Lots of friends in the chat today. Lots of friends. Ah. Uh, I think it's going to be fun. I have a couple of people in the uh, waiting room. I guess I'll give a little spiel about monetization and about making money as a home studio music producer. I think it's so interesting. Um, I don't know. It's hard to talk about the position that I'm in and not that it's difficult to talk about. It's just there's not a lot of language around it because I sort of operate in this space that is somewhere outside of the regular old school music industry you know when we think of the music industry and revenue generating what do we often think about um we think about touring we think about album sales or streaming um potentially merchandise and those are those four main revenue generators let me know in the chat if i'm missing any for the old school music industry now, what's happened over the years is people don't buy records anymore for the most part. For the most part, that was the only way you could actually get music was you go to the store and you bought a record, you bought a CD, um, whatever it may be. But that is, of course, not how it works anymore. Um, 
touring right now we're in the state of a pandemic where not a lot of people can tour so that's impacted folks um and then merch sales you know that that's the kind of most crossover shows of course yes touring shows etc i have operated in a space where i don't do shows i do live streams but i wouldn't consider that a show um don't do live performances or tour i don't really sell records streaming is not a main revenue of um main source of revenue for me and i create content and build community um around what i do um I still get to make music. It's just not in the form, always in the form. I do release traditional releases, singles, EPs, whatever, but it's not in the traditional form. I'm not reliant to this old standard of the music industry. I don't need a label. I'm accountable to you all as a community. I'm not necessarily um, reliant on a label and all these traditional uh, sort of revenue streams because I have things like YouTube, things like Instagram um, that have their own sources of revenue, like affiliate marketing. If, um, you know, I have Amazon links in the links in my description and those are affiliate links. So at no additional cost to you, if you like an item that you see in a video, you use the Amazon link to make a purchase, then I get a, a percentage kickback of that, which is really cool. Google obviously puts ads on YouTube videos. So every time you all watch the videos, the more people that view those ads, the more revenue is generated by the channel. So that's a revenue generator. And the thing about those two avenues is it's at no cost to you all. So you all can be part of the community and you all can consume the content, but you don't have to spend any money to support me in that way. But there are, of course, ways you can spend money to support an artist like me, right? So we've got the memberships on the channel. I've got controlfreakclub.com, things like that. So those are all options for people. And then selling sample packs is another option where, you know, you get something, you buy something, you get something. And revenue goes to me. So those are three kind of revenue generating things that actually cost money. But the bulk of what I do here on this channel is something that doesn't actually cost you the viewer money and that's always been very important to me i can share knowledge and you can all um get it for free but then as we build up that community and maybe you guys would like to check out my sample packs maybe you all want to support with merch maybe you all want to become members not all 130,000 whatever subscribers are going to want to do that um and that's just the reality and i'm okay with that reality so how can i generate revenue off of things where the user doesn't have to spend money but those who want to spend money are able to spend uh, money to support it's that kind of thinking and i like this a lot better than being dependent on um make an album hope that it does well and get paid 0.000011 cents for um a stream you know in addition, this community that, that continues to grow, that generates revenue um, directly by purchasing things from me or indirectly by just consuming the content also helps me build relationships with brands. So like Roly or Arturia or Akai or whatever, all of these brands, uh, Novation, um, as you can see, I have a lot of gear. So I would normally spend money on gear because music is what I really love to do. Um, it's one of my hobbies, well, not, not one of my hobbies. Now it's more of my career, but it started as a hobby. Um, and you spend a lot of money on your hobby sometimes in music, especially gear is pretty expensive. What the audience building and community building does is it allows brands to be able to send me gear for free. So that in a way saves me money. It doesn't directly generate revenue, but money that I would be spending on gear, um, goes somewhere else i can you know put more money into the space maybe my rent i can put more of that money toward my bills or i can put more money into expanding in some other way other than gear like camera equipment for instance improving the visual quality it's just one way and then so not only do brands end up sending gear but lots of brands also sponsor content so you all know i do a skillshare video um once a month and that's a sponsor, so that's revenue generating. And then also, oh, maybe we're having some connection issues. Let me know. So yes, sponsorships. I have a Skillshare sponsor once a month. That's great. As well as um, brands tend to sponsor content. 
um, if there is a, a release or they want to bring awareness to a product and it's always um, noted too in the content you always know if a piece of content is sponsored or if I'm just doing it because I feel like doing it um, so that's a revenue generator and then just brands that want shout outs or want to sponsor a stream etc cetera, etc cetera. Ed says uh, at the moment stream is working for me though good to know Raj oh what's going on it could be on a YouTube the YouTube side of things could be an issue Chris Branch hello hello um cool we, had, we do have people in the waiting room so I don't want to go on too too long so what did we mention so far building the community generates revenue indirectly through ads affiliate links etc we've got things that you can sell right merch sample packs channel memberships um Brand deals, getting free gear, so subsidizing your passion by getting stuff for free. Um, brand deals that actually sponsor with money, you know, they sponsor you to make a piece of content. And then I'll just say the fifth thing, and then we'll get into this to some calls, which if you're not in the waiting room yet, make sure you get in. We're keeping it to a tight hour today, so I'm going to try to make as, take as many calls I can about uh, during this hour. But the last one is, since I've gotten good at making content, um, and teaching and, and instructional stuff, I have been paid to make content for other brands are in this space, right? Um, so whether that's shooting a video course or tutorials for other outlets, that has become a source of revenue for me as well. So all of this to say, the, the way you can generate revenue through your passion, especially as a home studio music producer, has greatly broadened from the old school music um, industry sense. You know, it's mostly it's gone beyond just selling records, touring, selling merch. There's lots of things you can do um, beyond just those things. You can do a lot to build community. Um, I've seen some more people pop up in the chat. I saw Enigmatic Onion. Adrian says, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. There is uh, weekly giveaways with 343TV, by the way, which if you look at what RestreamBot just posted, um, head to the following link for this week's giveaway at Ableton. I think it's an Ableton voucher, which is good for all of you that want to get into Ableton Live with the new Live 11 release. I think we should get into taking some calls. So I greatly appreciate everybody for being here today. Don't forget to use the Zoom link in the chat. So that you can call in you'll be put into a waiting room when you come on stream it's not visual it's just audio so if you're like uh, self-conscious or nervous about that don't worry when you click the link like i said you're putting to the waiting room you're not just thrust into the stream so you have a little bit of time as i take your call make sure you mute the stream so that we don't get feedback and you want to listen through zoom and you want to have whatever mic you're using um, set up in the bottom left hand corner of zoom you know usually you can set your mic make sure it's set so that we, we don't have a lot of lag time before, um, you know, taking the call and answering the questions. I'm gonna pause the music for now. And let's go ahead and get some of these calls. I got Jalen Higgins in the waiting room. Jalen, I'm gonna pull you in. Make sure you mute the stream, get your mic ready, and we will be good to go. You all can keep me posted on how the levels are as we start taking callers. T Max says, Where are you from, brother? I am from Massachusetts. Thanks for asking. Where are you from, T Max Beats? Um, Jalen is connecting to audio while Jalen does that Nightbot also posted about a competition remix competition that's going on with band lab currently y'all should check that out anybody can use band lab from your web browser there's some cash prizes uh, for that remix contest and it's happening the whole month Dano's watching from Ecuador amazing Adrian's from Mexico web browser. oh hi Jalen make sure you mute the stream I got you. I got you. What's up, awesome. Pedro? How you doing, man? What's up, man? How are you? Thank you for calling in. Oh, no problem. No problem. No problem. Where are you calling in from? Uh, we coming in from Phoenix, man. Shouts out to my Phoenix people out there. I know there's probably some in the in the stream. Totally. How is the weather in Phoenix? Because I did a cross country trip and I thought Arizona was all warm, but when I drove through Arizona, it was like December and it was cold. You guys actually get snow there. Man, yeah, it depends on what part of Arizona you are. Either you uh you in the cold part of hell or you in the hot part of hell. That's funny. <laughs> Cuz we only get a couple weeks of winter, man, to be honest with you. Interesting. Yeah, I must have hit it in those yeah. perfect two weeks. I was so surprised. Well, hey, thank you for calling in. Um I would love to hear like what's your question? What do you want to chat about today? 
So um, being a producer, um, I realized these different points of revenue uh, amongst the industry, like when it comes to royalties and all these other things. And um, I was just curious, I know you have to have an LLC for a lot, a lot of that, like making a publisher for BMI, things like that. Um, but I found that there was a gray area that I might be missing. Like I have my LLC all registered in Arizona. Um, and I have like my uh, ID number, the entity ID number. Um, but I noticed that there was some things that I might need after the fact to register them or register like my LLC for uh, royalty like collection, if that makes sense. Totally. And so like, how did you learn about, how do you know that you have to have an LLC for royalty collection? Because I was unaware of that. And basically to give you a little insight into how my, the business side of what I do operates is sure. um, I don't have an LLC or anything. Mm -hmm. I operate as a sole proprietor. And to me, oh, it's, okay. it's made things a little bit easier. And I think one mm -hmm. thing that often happens is when people start to get involved in like this industry stuff is they, yeah. like, like a lot of people talk about, oh, I got to copyright my music. I got to whatever. And the, I don't copyright my music. It gets released. I already own the copyright. I don't have to do any formal thing. So I wonder if it's sure. a little bit of that, like, um, is, is having an LLC and having all these extra steps absolutely necessary? Or could you, could you operate without it i wonder and i wonder if it's a barrier to you actually being able to like get your stuff out there or even collect yeah um i feel like it's more so of a it's more so of a uh sorry i'm uh making my breakfast too at the same time it's okay um i feel like it's more of a a business kind of just securing your business um when it comes to like let's say selling packs or getting placements. Sure. Um, a lot, a lot of those companies look for that. And if you don't have anywhere to direct your funds, then it, it's kind of hard for, um, for you to really get a leg up. Um, you know, if, if it does come to the point where, you know, you get a placement or you get, you get further along in your career, well, let me push um, back on that a little bit. So what would stop you from just being a sole proprietor and you having a bank account that people can deposit into? Why, why does it have to be an LLC to direct funds to? Um, well, I feel like it's, it's maybe not for like exactly for the funds, but I mean, having like, let's say you have like artists underneath you, sure. um, you want to create like a publishing company. Like for me, I would use that LLC name as like a, a foundation to build publishing off of yeah. so I can start to get publishing and other rights and things like that. Um, I feel that so my, my follow-up question is how much publishing, how many publishing deals like have you landed? How much licensing stuff are you into? Like what, what is happening currently for your business? Um, well, and it's okay if it's I, like not much, it's okay if you're like just in the yeah, early stages. Totally, totally. I'm definitely in the early stage. This is, I wanted to get almost this secured first before I even, like when it comes to copyrights and actually signing up for a lot of these areas to get royalties I've already done. Yep. It's just, I know where like, I kind of want to go. And I feel like if I have that uh, established first, then I, that'll give me a leg up. Now, sure. when you talk about the sole proprietorship, for you, I know how you do packs and you do a lot of things with, you know, different companies and um, things like that. Like, how, how do you operate? Maybe that can give uh, another. Yeah, absolutely. Another side of the story for me. And I feel like I have to give the disclosure that like, I'm not a financial advisor. and Don't take this as like whatever advice. I'm just going to give my experience of what I do. Like, I just put that mm -hmm. out there for everybody. So like yeah. the whole thing for me is there's so many structures built around the music industry that make it difficult mm -hmm. for people to get in. And just like you're saying, be, like they it overcomplicates things, especially at the early stages. So what often happens is people get caught up in these very like uh, complicated structures and details and don't end up doing the full idea of what they do. But you, you sound like you sure. have a very good idea of like what you want to do and areas you want to go in and you're doing well with, um, you know, kind of preparing for that. So if it ever becomes a barrier, though, like this is kind of why. And 
what I have done, the way I have always operated is I want to move fast and break stuff. I want to um, just do what I want to do and then figure it out. I want to ask forgiveness, not permission kind of thing. That's kind of how I operated. Mm -hmm. But it's worked out pretty well and I haven't done anything too radical. In terms of a sole proprietorship, basically it just means that all the money that I make goes directly to me and I operate as a sole proprietor. So I basically am my business. Okay. So everything, all the income goes directly to me. It doesn't go to some other entity. It doesn't go to whatever. As I grow, maybe that will change. But mm-hmm. if I had to do all the stuff that you're talking about with like setting up an LLC, getting this license and doing this and whatever, if I had to do that when I first started, it would have been such a barrier for me to even start right. doing things because f- for me, it's very hard to sometimes find motivation to do some of these bigger things and some of these bigger things require a lot of steps so throwing one more wrench in that throws the complication of like legality and like licensing and government structure that usually operates pretty inefficiently would have been a huge barrier for me to starting my business but now i'm like probably five years into like doing this you know i'm at the most at the highest level of doing this professionally as i ever have been across these five years this has worked out for me and I haven't been held back from the barrier. So like for when I hear your situation, it sounds like you're very smart and you have a very clear idea of what you want to do and what you that you want to build something big. I just mm-hmm. wonder is in this early stages, could you start working and learning a little bit small, like in a little bit smaller capacity, even though, yes, you have ambition to build something that has a lot to do with like publishing and signing other artists, potentially things like that. But you're not going to do that maybe today. Maybe you build something a little bit for yourself, learn some lessons, don't get caught up in so many of these barriers. Then maybe a year, two years from now, when you've built up a solid structure for yourself and you learned a lot of those lessons, then go the full LLC route and then go the full like legit, legit. I'm going to start signing some other artists. I'm going to start doing some other things. You know what I mean? I just don't want those structures to be barriers to people. And I feel like the industry is built around like this idea of gatekeeping of like, mm-hmm. oh, if you want to be over here, you have to do this. Like I, I knew so many people in music school that would get caught up like, oh, I have to copyright my music before I release it. I have to do all this stuff like that's There's so much yeah. gatekeeping barrier structure stuff around the music industry that I want people to know that they can kind of bypass, learn some lessons and then go back and do it the right way or then go back and, you know, start something sure. in a different way, in a more legit way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, Thatcher. I, I really do. Um, yeah, okay, all right. I, I'll take I'll take heed to what you're saying. Something um, to think about. It doesn't always have to be, you know, completely by the book because you know what it is. There's a lot of stuff that gets done not by the book that doesn't get yeah. talked about a lot because it's really easy to talk about the book. It's really easy to Most reference definitely. the book. But in this new music industry that we're in and that has been developing over the last decade and has really ramped mm-hmm. up over the past couple of years, it's all so new and it's also just happening that there hasn't been time to collect resources to share information about right. um, how it's operating. So the best thing for you is like, look at how other people are operating or try to try to get that inside info, you know, listen to a lot of podcasts, as many interviews as possible um, mm-hmm. to get that inside info on how the industry is currently operating. So the, you're not caught up in the old school ideas that maybe, um, you know, aren't the way anymore, or at least aren't the way for you at whatever stage that you're at, you know? Right, right. Speaking of the new music industry, I know I know uh, there's some other callers. Let's hear it. To keep it tight. Sure. Um, so what what you think about uh, NFTs just shifting the paradigm a little bit, like just yeah. NFTs in, uh, in, in the game, because it, it's, it's the potential is pretty, it's really big. I've been tracking it very closely. I I talk about this all the time, but I'm way more inspired by the visual art world than I am the like yes, music industry yeah, world. Yeah, um, so yeah. th- from that specific angle, NFTs are very interesting to me. And I love just hearing people talk about it. And I know that mm-hmm. I know I already saw somebody in the chat went, oh, God, not NFTs, because I think there's a lot of <laughs> oversaturation. There's a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. He- here's the thing. I want to speak on a little bit about like what I'm thinking about NFTs. But I also want to speak about first about the conversation around NFTs, which is kind of like yeah. meta and annoying but you have a lot of people and i want you all to to be careful about who you're listening to and about 
like what content you're consuming around it. Cause there are some people that know a thing or two, you know, about the art mm-hmm. world, about selling, about creative work, about whatever. And that and if, to them talking about NFTs makes total sense. Then there are a lot of people that are talking about NFTs because it's a hot Google, Googleable word that people will yeah. tune into and it's the hot topic. So there's a lot of people just talking about it. And I see a lot of this mm-hmm. in the music industry, people who never had any idea about crypto or never had any idea about, yeah. you know, this world all of a sudden are talking about nfts like they're experts so i just caution I just say just most people just do your due diligence exactly I mean, like, it, for anything like in general like you got to do your research you can't take somebody's word off of something yeah and um, and deep research and because a, a lot of the research and let me just do a Okay, thank you to SolarJet for typing what a NFT was in the chat, but I'll just lay the ground for that. NFT, non-fungible token, it's linked to crypto, Ethereum specifically. Basically, it's a way of creating um, like one-of-a-kind digital art, like scarcity. Mm-hmm. When we think about music, we have our music and it's everywhere. It goes out to all the streaming platforms. When I make a sample pack, anybody can buy it, whatever. But let's say I want to make an NFT sample pack. I would make a one-of-one one NFT sample pack. I would mint it with the crypto and you would have proof that, look, okay, you're the sole owner of that sample pack or something like that, yep. you know? And um, what mm-hmm. you're saying about doing due diligence Yes, but also for folks doing the due diligence, don't get caught up in the fact that Grimes made six million dollars on her release. Or, absolutely, or people absolutely. made whatever. I was just about to say that. Yep. You have to yep. be very clear about what you're looking at because a lot of people that are making a lot of money on NFTs right now are people with big audiences already. Yes. Um, yes. You look at somebody um, like I just saw a a sample pack. I was following a sample pack that got released as an NFT because I thought that that would make a sense for a good model for it. Um, by Illmind yeah. and Illmind sold his sample pack for I think it went for six thousand dollars. Crazy, crazy. It's crazy. People actually, people actually want to own. It's the it's the ownership. I agree. The collect the collectability. Now, will. now, mind you, that's in dollars, so I don't know what that amounts to. That that had only had. Think of Illmind, who's this huge producer who is Grammy award winning and also like multi nominations, um, sells a sample pack that has 10 melodies, 10 melody files in it. One of one. You get full rights to use the samples. It only and I say only, but this is it's still a big thing because it's the first one only had 13 bids on it. And it sold for six thousand dollars, which, when you think about it, that is crazy. Like you could sell a one a sample pack of ten sounds for six thousand dollars, but somebody like Illmind got thirteen bids on it. That's not an astronomical yeah. astronomical amount of bids. So if you filter right. everything down into your level of where you are, and I think of it as me as an artist, where I am at as an artist, if Illmind's getting thirteen bids, I'm gonna post something and get what two bids, maybe one bid, or I would have to price it, you know, accordingly. So. Uh, The other thing, the last thing I'll say is NFTs, there's some pretty poor implications about like impact on the environment because of the technology it uses to run Um, Mm -hmm. as well. So I want to watch that as well as there's a lot of hype right now in people wanting to buy NFTs because there's hype and they want to be cool and they want to own an NFT. And a lot of what has to do with NFTs is the the reselling right so there's benefit to the artist because through the secondary market and reselling that nft like say you buy the sample pack and you want to resell it on the secondary market Mm -hmm. there's usually within the smart contract of the nft a 10 percent commission that goes back to the original artist so every time it gets resold the original artist gets a kickback and the secondary Mm -hmm. market seller obviously can flip it for a profit. I think that's what a lot of people are thinking. And that's traditional mm-hmm. art world, right? You buy a piece of art, you keep it for yeah. a while, and then maybe you sell it for a profit if it goes up in value. That's trading cards, that's stocks. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's all the same thing. Exactly. Um, but I think what is going to happen is because there's so much hype around things right now, people are selling things at a premium and the secondary market is going to deflate a bit in my, I, yeah. I predict the secondary market will deflate a bit um, going forward. And a lot of people are going to have these items that they paid a lot of money for and the value will have gone down significantly. So mm-hmm. in a way, I love the idea of scarcity in digital art. I would love for there to be a way 
if one day we we live in this metaverse, you know, 10 to 20 to 30 years from now, where mm -hmm. you can have a virtual office and in that office, there's a radio and you can click play and you're the only one that has this Tatro track, these Tatro chill beats playing in your virtual office. I think that yeah, that's a cool yeah. application, um, a, a cool piece of art on your wall that you're the only one who owns and it's digital. Um, I am super excited and cautious and you don't see me doing a video on it because I'm not trying to be a shark and jump on a trend and talk about something that hasn't played out. I think we're, we're still in it. We're still in the infancy. Yes. And it, it's, infancy of it. it scares me that people have this knee jerk reaction that every time something happens, they have to speak on it. Like I do, don't feel <laughs> yeah. comfortable speaking on anything unless I'm totally confident and have done some research and, and talked about it. So like I'm, we're giving a conversation, we're having a conversation about it now and we're having, I'm just yeah. giving my initial reaction, but in no way is this my final takeaway opinion. And in no way am I saying like, this is what you should think about NFTs because like, I just yeah. don't know. And shame on the people that are sharing information because they read a couple articles and they haven't really, it hasn't played out yet. You know what I mean? So like, for sure. It, 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 we can't speak definitively. I don't think many, I think there are people that can speak um, semi definitively that have been in the world that are very knowledgeable. And I think there's a, mm -hmm. a lot of people that are speaking definitively, definitively that have no place speaking definitively, to be honest. For sure. Hey man, well, I appreciate your whole conversation, man. I've been watching you since literally like probably a thousand subs maybe less i appreciate so, like, that thank you so much for sure for sure bro for sure inspiration 100 percent. so y'all you have a good rest of your day awesome you too Jalen. thank you so much have a good one all right all right later yeah nfts it's like a big topic so and and then no name in the chat says we are a bit further than embassy we have we've just passed the early majority, but inventor stage and early adopter stage has been passed now. So we're not in infancy at all. Yeah, I, I think I'm just speaking from a consumer and a market perspective. Sure, NFTs have been around for a while, but in terms of like market adoption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, meaning that in the zeitgeist of the public and people knowing about it, we are in the infancy. So that's kind of what what's going to happen. What's going to happen to the market now um, as people start to buy things, et cetera. And I think the important the, there is an important note about the environment. I don't think it means that okay, shut it down. I think that it means okay, if this thing if we can build this thing sustainably and so that it's not so harmful to the environment, let's figure out how to do that, right? Like I still own a van, I still drive a car. That's bad for the environment. Um, when they were inventing cars, they didn't know the environmental impact of you know using gasoline and the way the cars operated and the human impact on the environment they didn't know that so they didn't have that knowledge but now we know that so we're building electric vehicles and things that are better for the environment so what i'm saying is now with nfts we're building this thing at a time when we know about the human impact on the environment and the world so scarcity digital art all that ways for artists to generate revenue in a big way and get compensated in a big way is fantastic. Let's not throw away the whole idea. Let's build it sustainably. That That's my whole thing. I think I'll, too many people are like, nope, NFTs are bad for the environment. It's terrible. Get rid of it. Find another way. I think it's somewhere in between. It's this is a good thing in theory and the idea is good. How do we build it sustainably? That's what I think. Yeah, and no name. It sounds like you can speak very. Uh, please share whatever information you have and thoughts about the NFT space in the chat. Um, no name, because you're probably seem very knowledgeable. You know. Okay, Andrew, let's get Andrew in here. Continue to take the calls. Continue to take the calls. Hi, Andrew. How's it going? Hi. Um, uh, I turned off the chat. I have one question. To well, first, how, let's say hello. Where are you calling in from? How's it going? Let's 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 uh, check in. Moscow. Moscow. Russia. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Thank you for calling in, Andrew. Uh, what did you want to talk about? Let's let's get into it. Um, I'm beginner producer, and uh, I want to. Um, one moment. I'm sorry. It's okay. Take your time. Sorry, uh, I'm a beginner producer, and I want uh, you to advise me. Like, uh, maybe it's a stupid question, but uh, like, I what I need to do to like it's only 
the hobby in my opinion uh, for me it's a hobby but um, so i want to like when i need to like read or uh study um, music like do you need to read do you need to do that classical kind of training is that the question yeah but like uh i have uh, some bass uh but i can't like uh <clears throat> apply it in tracks or uh like uh i I'm, I'm playing drums and piano sure. for four years old nice and to, uh and like i want to do uh some tracks for well i love it but it's uh it's really hard for me and i want to apply it Right. This information and uh, so you're having trouble connecting your like traditional piano and musical training to the music production stuff that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, because what often happens is people who are are trained classically, if if it's not taught in a way that you make the connection, like you might just be learning p classical pieces and not really understanding like kind of what's going on in them. And a lot of the times they're more complicated than some of the contemporary, contemporary simple music that we want to make. So it's tough to, it's, it's tough to connect those two worlds. But what I would say is you do have an advantage having that um, knowledge and learning to play in that musical background. So it is an advantage. What I would say is now take that knowledge that you have and learn some pieces that are more don't go learn it well learn classical pieces as you please but find music that you really like and music that you want to recreate the style of and learn those pieces don't just um don't and once you do that once you learn those pieces um, and you connect the dots between how to play those pieces and common things that are happening in those pieces you'll start to understand the inner workings of it because you have the advantage of you could probably look up a song um, and play it. You could probably read the music pretty easily or you could you, your ears are probably pretty good if you've been studying since you were four. So playing things by ear probably comes easy to you. So use those skills to your advantage, but learn some more contemporary pieces, learn some music that's in the style of the music you want to make and pay very close attention to like, oh, these chords are in this type of song are generally in first inversion or this chord progression, the one, five, six, four progression is very common, you know? So use that advantage that you have in your skills to start to learn some, some of the music that you want to recreate the style of. That's my suggestion. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, thank you for uh, like for your time. Of course, uh, I'm very appreciated. That like it's a big motivation for me to do some new tracks or right. to study something. Thank you. You got it, Andrew. Thanks so much, and and call again in the future too. We'd love to hear how it, it's going and follow up sometime. So thanks so much for calling in. Thank you. Have a good one. Yes, yes, yes. Great call. Great call. Great call. Great conversation going on. I see a lot running through in the chat. Um, so thank you all for the good conversation. It's going well. I have more calls to take, of course, in the chat. Um, what I want to say is, oh, I'm live three days a week, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Tuesdays, hey, we're live right now, but I'm also going to be live this evening at 7 p.m. PST. We're going to be making some music, just kind of like a chill making beats stream be live again on Thursday at noon PST and Saturday at 7 p.m. PST. So keep that in mind. And if there's more, people can tag me in things if we want to speak more on the NFT thing, if that's kind of a hot topic of conversation. But for now, I'm going to keep going. Binch in the chat. We're going to keep talking to the community through the calls. Thank you all so much for tuning in. The show is live every Tuesday, by the way, at 10 a.m. PSD. Hello, Binch. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for calling in. Where are you calling in from today? Uh, I'm calling in from Liverpool. From Liverpool. It's so I love this show because people call in from everywhere. We had Moscow, Phoenix, Arizona, and now Liverpool. I, I'm all about it. How are things in Liverpool? Cold? Um, yeah, cold and, yes. cold and rainy. Uh, what team do we root, root for over there? Liverpool. Liverpool, definitely. of course. I don't know anything about that world, but yes, go Liverpool. Somebody was cheering for Blackpool. Is that a team? Is that somehow related? Uh, yeah, but I like further down south than we are. 
Got it. Got it. Okay. This is a whole sports. I don't even understand American sports. So gosh. Uh, well, thanks for calling in. What do you want to chat about today? I um, was just wondering about, so I don't know, just with um, sort of, I'm just getting used to um, music production <clears throat> and I don't know. I just sort of don't have motivation to finish tracks. I'll get a really good idea and then drop it and not come back to it. And I just, I don't really know how to find the motivation to sort of finish stuff. Yeah. It sounds like you're a little bit like me. The most exciting part about making a track for me is starting with the blank canvas and having an idea and coming up with those new ideas. You know, that's for me, I'm the same way. That's the most exciting part of making a track. I think for me, I really have to push myself and, and it could be different for you. It could be different for anybody, but a part of my identity as a musician, um, is releasing finished music. Like I would like to have a body of work to point to and say like, Hey, yes, these, these are my tracks. You can go listen to my tracks. And for a while I didn't really have that because I was falling into the same trap as you. And I'm really excited about making the music. Now for some people that might not be important. So you could decide, Hey, is that even important to you to have this body of work to point to and say, Hey, this is my work. Or do you like, like I love playing, um, I love playing cyberpunk right now, but I'm not going to like go make a YouTube channel about me playing cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is just something I sit and I play and I do and I enjoy and it's over. For some people, music could be the same thing. A lot of people who make it their hobby, like you could sit, make some music, it's your hobby, it's done, it's over. And there's completely nothing wrong with that, no matter what level of track finishing you do. But um, a lot, many people do want to have that body of work to point to. And it is about kind of pushing yourself limiting yourself, creating, um, not restrictions, but limitations where it's like, how can you spend your time differently? And, and how can you have that self-discipline that will develop more and more over time to say, okay, no, I'm not going to start a new track today. I'm going to go over to start finishing this track that I already started. And one technique that really worked for me was, um, before I fin before I leave working on a project, I, I use Ableton Live, so it's very easy to get caught up in this um, style because you work in loops in the session view, and if you never move them to arrangement view, then they just stay loops, and that a loop is not a con a, a finished song, you know. Um, so what I started doing was before I finished working on a project for the day. Um, I would take those session view loops and move them into arrangement view and get a very basic arrangement plotted out on the timeline. And I found that that was enough to propel me forward so that instead of just like hearing this loop that's very favorable to continue to listen to and listen to, um, that once I got it on the timeline and I could start to envision it as a finished track, I could at least make the decision one way or another. If I got it onto the timeline and I felt like, oh, it was kind of lackluster anyway, I would probably just move on and start a new track the next day. But if I got onto the timeline and I was like, then some ideas started sparking like, oh, and then I can do this riser here. And oh, it kind of needs, it's calling for a B section here. Let me start that B section. It kind of at least gets the ball rolling and thinking about finishing it. Um, and I know one way or another, once I have it in that arrangement view um, and taking it out of the, the continuous loop that it, it either sparks my inspiration to finish it or I realize like, oh, I'm not going to finish that. So I don't feel guilty about not finishing it. And then uh, I can move on to the next track and repeat the process. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you work in Ableton Live or what's your dog? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Ableton. Yeah, it's very, very common because you know what it is? Like listening to a loop, A, it's hard to... Um, your brain gets so like used to it as it's on repeat for so much that it's hard to hear anything else and have it sound right. Like have it sound like it makes sense in your head. So that's why a lot of people like it's hard to make B sections too. And then it's just like, it's a little bit addicting. I don't know, listening to those loops over and over and, and putting it into an arrangement view where it has to have a beginning, middle and end is just a different way for the brain to be wired. Another thing to think about too is can you split up your phases of working, you know? Like maybe for, um, you know, maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you're working on new tracks, but you're going to dedicate the weekend to, you know, really finishing and arranging some of the tracks that you worked on earlier in the week, or you're just going to pick one of the tracks and, and fully arrange it and fully finish it. 
Last thing I'll say on this, because I think a lot of people experiment the same problem, but I don't want to be too overwhelming with information, is sometimes when we avoid things, like if we avoid finishing a track, it's because there's some gap in our skill that we are avoiding um, because learning new skills is hard and, and the brain always wants to do what's easier. So if there are skills that are that are lacking in some of us for arranging because we've gotten so good at making loops, we haven't honed the skills of arranging and finishing tracks. That could come down to mixing, mastering, overall arrangement, orchestration, adding the bells and the whistles like risers and effects. Um, it's worth also just diving in and doing some studies on music that you love, analyzing the arrangement, analyzing the mix, analyzing those final stage things so that when you go in or even watching some tutorials so that when you go in to finish your tracks, you have some knowledge and you feel like you know what you're going in to do um, rather than sometimes if we feel insecure, we feel like we don't know how to approach finishing a track. We just say, well, then I'm not going to finish a track, you know? Yeah. Hopefully one of those techniques you maybe find helpful. I don't know if any of them specifically speak to you or sound like you could give them a shot. I think the arrangement view, definitely. I do use that sometimes, but I sort of just like take instruments out and then put instruments in. I don't really like change or add anything. Sure. Like then different. the next step for you, for sure, go listen to like three or so songs that you really like and just really listen to their structure and, and in the terms of like, okay, it's this loop, it's this loop, it's this loop. But now, oh, all of a sudden it's a B section. Getting to arrangement view definitely helps you to create that B section. And you all you have to do, you can add new elements or not, but it's all about taking the elements you already have like a rock band, right? When they go, I, I say this analogy all the time. When a rock band goes from the verse to the chorus, they don't all switch instruments. They stay playing the guitar, the drums, and the bass, but they switch up what they're playing. They switch up the chord progression, and that's what makes the new section of the song. We can apply that to electronic music. You just take all those elements you already built up in this A section and this, these loops you've already built, and now within the arrangement view, block out four, eight, or 16 bars that you say, okay, I'm going to make a new section that fits in the same world because I'm going to use the same sounds, but offers something new. Maybe the beat stays the same, the chord progression changes. Um, maybe the feel changes. Maybe you do add one more synth layer that brings that section to the next level. So that I would say is the next step because you might still get caught up in the loop even if you go to arrangement view, but try to plot out eight or 16 bars for a B section in that arrangement and create something new within arrangement. That That is what has really helped me for finishing tracks and making my tracks slightly more complex than the general session view loops. Yeah, thanks Thanks for the advice. I definitely will take that into consideration with um, like using B sections to try and instead of just, I don't know, I think that's what happens with me. I try and end up like adding a new instrument and then that becomes its own song and then I work on that instead. Instead of just focusing on one thing, I end up basically procra procrastinating. Absolutely. Because it's it's slightly harder to create a new section within an existing world than it is just to create something new that exists by itself. It's easier. Like our brains like always push us to do something that's easier. But the more you do this, the more you can push yourself to do the um to be more disciplined. You know, it, it's self-discipline and, and that takes time. You know, and, and it, it could be something as simple as being public with a goal, like, hey, I'm going to release a track once a month or, hey, I'm going to release a track, you know, however much works for you. If you say that to an audience or even if you just say it to your friends or family, it somehow holds you accountable, you know, and maybe a little bit of that pressure could help, too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Minch, thank you so much for calling in. Go Liverpool. <laughs> thank you. Have a good one. You too. Want to shout out Raj? Oh, uh, my friend Raj. I know Raj. Becoming a VIP. Welcome to VIP, Raj. Uh, we do have memberships on this channel. You can click the join button to see what perks you can get. It's a great way to support the channel and get some perks for yourself. Right now at the VIP tier, which is what Raj just joined, he gets access to the Discord. He gets uh, the Shore sample pack, which is a $9 sample pack free with his membership. Access to the monthly members only live stream. Um, and there's probably other stuff in there I'm forgetting, but yeah, VIP is the way to go because I'm working on my new sample pack that'll be out later this month. Once the new sample pack is out, Shore will not be available to VIP members anymore. So if you want to get that Shore sample pack, become a member now 
and then you will get the other sample pack that comes out later this month for free as well. New member shout. I wonder what the member count is, Joseph McCaffrey, if you can tell me. Ah, uh, yes. Hey, actually, Raj O is in the waiting room, I just noticed, so let's go. Of course, I said we're keeping it to a tight hour, but we are absolutely not based on this waiting room, but I'm going to close the waiting room, so maybe we can um, take the link on a night bot as well and say calls are closed because we have a few more. Hi, hey, Raj. Pedro. Raj, welcome to the member squad. Hey, what's going on? Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on, man. I appreciate the support. I appreciate you becoming a member. How have things been? It's been a while since we last spoke. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, things are pretty good. I did take a break. Uh, I was going a little too hard, too fast. So I feel that February, I like chilled out and just focused on improving my skills. So my skill gap is, you know, the gap is smaller. So my tracks are better. It's I've a, already seen the, the improvement. It's a constant push and pull. And let me just kind of break down that concept for the chat really, really quick. What Raj is talking about is something I think a lot about. It's like, uh, all right, we have our ideas and our vision of what we want to do as artists, and then we have our skills. And oftentimes, those are not matched up. So sometimes our vision is here and our skills are here. And then other times it reverses. We build up our skills and they surpass our vision. So then we have to find inspiration um, to catch up to our skills, you know? Um, and it's a constant push and pull. So it sounds like you, I, it's, that's a very smart thing that you said, Raj, about. Um, taking the time acknowledging that and being like oh let me go build up some skills so my skills can match up to my ideas you know that's smart yeah exactly and i was just thinking that because uh someone else mentioned having the struggle with making the b section and i had that same issue so um i'm finding it easier now making that b section right totally that's great awesome to hear yeah so i guess i just have like a quick question or maybe just looking for some uh, sage advice from, from Tatro himself. I'll try. Um, <laughs> so like I mentioned, going too hard too fast, I actually got some like requests lined up from uh, people I know. And um, what kind of requests? Really cool. like, so, all right. So one of them, someone wanted me to make um, a trap beat of a certain style. And the style is kind of foreign to me. So that was the one reason why I was kind of like, sitting back and sure. trying to work on my skills. And he said, you know, plenty of time to work on it, whatever. Uh, that one's good. Uh, another job was to, uh, I have a friend who is into making apps for, for phones, like, like Very cool. mini puzzle games. Yeah. And he's done pretty well with them in the past and he's making a new one and wants me to make the music for it. That's amazing. And I, I've, I've done a yeah. similar thing. I've got a developer friend, you know, when I was very, uh, when I was much younger and, you know, maybe in the early days of the channel, he was developing apps and I would do the music kind of sound design for them. So that's, that's cool. Cause I've, I've, I've done that same thing. I, I have a question and all are valid. There's no, like not one answer is better than the other. Are you doing these like for like as friends, like on spec, is there any like exchange of, you know, funds or value exchange here? Or are you kind of just doing it for friends as like passion projects? Um, so those first two, they are willing to pay. Um, and I don't really have like a payment lined up. Sure. And I don't have, I, don't, I haven't created the music yet yeah. for it. I have created some music, like my little stockpile of here's my work so far. Uh, the video game guys like love it. So yeah, well, I'm not too worried about making their music. But I guess the Land Trap one is like the, the one I'm a little more worried about because I don't have all the skills for yet. Totally. And here's the thing. I'm so glad um, you're speaking on this because it follows a path that I kind of followed as well. Even if it, it it's probably not going to be like a ton of money, like based on like where you're at, like, um, like you're not this prolific game composer yet, or this prolific, you know, trappy com media composer for whatever yet. So like your rates will go up over time. But to, to be even getting like any amount of money is fantastic. And what it really amounts to is some people should think about is paid training. If you can get paid, even if it's not a lot, to work on a project where you're not only getting to create music, but you're getting a little bit of money and you're learning a new skill, like you said, with like you're learning how to make this style beat for this specific piece of media, like... You getting a little bit of money for that is great. That's paid training. You're not just working on the project for spec or whatever. 
either way, the the what you'll learn from working on the project, whether you're getting paid or not, is value enough. But getting paid on top of that, that's paid training. So like there's so many projects that I've said yes to that I wasn't a hundred percent sure I could pull off, that I wasn't a hundred percent knowledgeable about the material. But since I was getting paid, I took the time to learn. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. That's actually what I wanted to hear too. Just some uh, ex your your own personal experiences with, I guess, juggling wanting to make your own tracks that is kind of like your own artistic style, uh, along with promoting, I guess, yourself as a producer and also doing the jobs that you're getting that are coming in. Yeah, for and I sure. know for for a time you were also working a full time job. Right. So that's this is where I'm at. I'm actually working a full time job as well as trying to make this music thing happen. So, or may, I am making this music thing happen. So I don't know. Just want to hear. I guess your past experiences and how you were able to juggle all those things. Yeah, I think it is a commitment to understanding that it is a juggle and that it's not easy and that it's not um, something that's going to feel super relaxed all the time. But the only thing that I can say, and this is true for me, this is my personal experience for me, like music is just in my DNA the same way that I am like a human, the same way I have brown hair. Like, so I, I don't know. A lot of times people get caught up in this conversation about work-life balance. And I think there is a valid conversation to be had there. I worked in a nonprofit. There was not great work-life balance um, and it was a little bit rough. So I understand not good work-life balance, but that was me working for somebody else. When I look at me as a musician, as a creative, as somebody who just loves to create things, um, then like, I don't, I, like if I'm working a ton on music stuff, I'm like, man, my boss is a real jerk. I don't have a lot of good work-life balance because I'm constantly working on this music stuff. Like, no, I'm the boss. The music is me. Like the music is in me. I'm the one who does the music. You know what I mean? So like, and it doesn't matter, like, if you had to take work home and you had to work on it in bed from, like, 10 to 11 or 11 to 12 or 10 to, 10 to 1 a.m. or whatever, you'd probably be pretty pissed because of the work-life balance. But when I'm just, like, chilling in my bed and I have my laptop and I'm working on a track, which I was doing last night and I was doing it the night before, like, I'm not mad about it. I also think about, like, how else would my time be getting filled? Like, sure, I'm really enjoying cyberpunk right now and I'm having a good time playing it and I do want to play it, but... Um, it's not the biggest priority. I do it when I want to, and I have the freedom to do that, but like, I'm not mad that I'm working on music all the time. I'm not mad that I'm doing creative work all the time because this is what I signed up for as a creative. I could very easily go get a job somewhere else. I could get a job doing the same thing that I was doing before and work a nine to nine to five or whatever. And then have all my other free time weekends to not have to worry about any of this stuff. But no, I signed up to be a creative. I signed up to be a musician. It's in my blood. It's in my whatever. And I'm a hundred percent fine with working seven days a week on something that is literally my passion. You know what I mean? Like, I don't feel like, of course I take days off. Of course there's some days oh, yeah. Joseph McCaffrey in the chat will tell you where I'm just literally sleeping on the couch or like, I don't feel like doing anything, but there, if there are days that I feel like working 12, 15 hour days, doing all these different things or doing all these different creative projects. I'm not mad about that. Like I love doing creative stuff. I'm just kind of like, it's, it's part of what I do. It, it, it's just in me. So I think there is a certain commitment that we have to make to ourselves is like, are you a creative person? Like, do you love doing creative work? If you love it, don't get caught up in the work-life balance conversation that is valid for some people. But if you're generating your own work-life balance problem, that's not valid. Like if you're your own boss and in, from a creative sense, and you have work-life balance issues, that's on you. That's not on anybody else, you know? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think uh, that's part of part of what I was like learning through my my month off too. Um, and that what you said really resonates with what's helping me uh, move forward with, with creating and taking ownership and being my own boss. So uh, yeah, I really appreciate all those, the words of wisdom. Yeah. We're, we're on an uphill battle as creatives. Like there's nobody saying like, like for your day job, for you doing your day job, there is a culture around like, yes, you should get paid to do what you're doing as creatives, as like self-made, like freelance contractor, creatives, whatever. Nobody's out there saying, Hey, you should get paid. You should get paid. You got to pave the way for yourself for that. And, um, that only goes by putting in the work. And you're up against, we, we're all up against other people that are putting in a ton of work. So if you constantly think about 
that balance, you know, if you spend a, if I spend a certain amount of my time making music and then a certain amount of my time playing cyberpunk, at some point, if the majority of my time playing cyberpunk takes over, I'm no longer like a musician. I'm just like a am- amateur cyberpunk player. But if I play a little bit of cyberpunk, but I spend all of my other time making music, like I can be sure of myself and say like, yeah, I'm putting the time in. I'm doing what I can. Yes, take breaks sometimes. But like, how are you spending the majority of your time? Some people don't even audit their time and don't even know how much time they're wasting to YouTube, to entertainment, to whatever, which entertainment is important for inspiration. But like balance, it's all about balance. And like if the thing you want to commit your life to is not... um, heavier on the scale then something's not adding up your goals are probably not going to get accomplished right totally that's a lot that's that's a lot i don't know (laughs) i hope i I hope that helps everyone too i mean i from what i realized taking that month off it actually didn't hurt me at all and these people even though some of these projects actually happened they were in the talkings before my break um, well, and here's my question. You totally see, cool with it. You're referring to it as a month off. What did you do for that month? You sat around and watched I, TV and ate chips. Like, what did you do for that month off? I'll, I'll be real. I ate, I did watch a lot of anime. <laughs> cool. Um, but I did also play a ton of melodics, like an insane amount of melodics. Um, okay. And that was just kind of like my cheat. Like, I kind of felt like I was just having fun. But I also, in the back of my head, I was like, this is going to make me really good at trap music. So. If you really look at that, like that was not a month off, you know, even watching anime, I'm sure you started to notice things about the music in the anime. I'm sure you started to notice. I'm sure like the stories moved you. I'm sure like you that you were impacted by characters and that all influences your art. And then with the melodics thing, that's skill building. That's straight up skill building, um, even if it feels gamified. So that is a big secret in it, too, is like you build things around your life that you know, maybe feel like taking a break and maybe feel like time away from your main thing. You might not have Ableton open on your computer, but you're somehow skill building and influencing your work throughout everything you do. And if the things you do when you take a break can serve that purpose as well, like that's, that's perfect creative life there. Like when I take a break to play cyberpunk, like I'm super inspired by the music in cyberpunk. I'm super inspired by the stories, um, by the sound design, you know, like, yeah, so sure. like it's still adding value to me as an artist without being a total cop out. Like there's very few things where we just shut our minds off, but the more things like that you build around your life where you're taking a break, quote unquote, but also somehow building a skill, somehow getting inspiration. Um, those are all amazing things. And we, we can all kind of shift our attention to think of the things in our lives like that for sure. Yeah, definitely. I think I feel a lot less guilty about the break and actually, I was starting to feel like, man, this was a great break. It actually made me better and music more motivated. And from what you said, also making me feel uh, feeling great. So appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you for calling in, Raj. I appreciate it. Yeah. Good call. Thanks for having me. Have a good Later. one. Yeah, the other thing I'm thinking about is what Raj said about feeling guilty. If you're going to take a break from music, from whatever you're doing, be deliberate about that break and do not allow yourself to feel guilty about it. Because if you spend a whole break feeling guilty that you're not doing X, Y, Z, um, that's not very relaxing. That's not going to be very rejuvenating. And when you come back to the thing that you're doing, um, it's going to not feel like you took a break. So take straight up breaks and don't feel guilty about it. And you'll feel so refreshed after. Hi, Juma. I'm well. How are you? I also saw Rashane pop in the chat. I saw Phil popped in the chat. Um, shout out to all the members out there. Thank you all. Um, I am keeping an eye on the chat. I'm going to keep rolling with calls, though, because we have uh, four more and we are over time. But STK, fantastic lo-fi guitar player, beat producer, channel member, fantastic member of the community. STK, what's up? Hello, hello. Nice to talk to you. Hey, I want to say your music is dope. If those of you who don't know, you should check out I'm Prod by STK. Um... Uh, we, ch- we, we checked out STK's music on the last couple track review streams and like really, really great beats. So thank you for submitting. Thank you for being a member. Um, thank you for making, gr- putting great art into the world, you know, appreciate it all. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you for your feedback though. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I really enjoy listening to your work and I enjoy like giving feedback. It's great to give work to feedback to an artist that is like a, you know, 
create such great music, you know, because like you can only get better and better and better. And you also have seem to have a good idea of your sound and stuff, you know, so whether or not you take any of my feedback, it, it doesn't even matter. It's still, um, you know, it's, it's oh, you, sure, it's dude, you and your sound. There's always a little something that like I can apply to my music, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, what did you want to talk about today? Actually, where are you calling in from? I'm in LA right now. In Looking LA. For Looking for a new uh, crib. What what uh, neighborhoods yeah. are you looking in? If, um, unless that's unless you uh, don't I want to answer. I'm gonna be near Hollywood because I'm I'm going to school for music. You know, a little soon, like around fall. Cool. But uh, I'm from Boston. That's so crazy because I'm from Massachusetts yeah. and I live in LA. Small world, huh? Small world. That's wild. All right, I just had like just want to ask for advice, really, because I've been trying to develop my brand, but at the same time, I have no idea where to get started at it. Sure. And, uh, I was going to ask you, if you were, let's say, a producer starting from zero, uh, where would you start as in, like, what social medias and yada yada? Ah, uh, well... Let me first start by saying you have this huge advantage of having this body of work and this music that people are already responding to. So you, that's a big advantage for you. Like when I started my channel and my brand or whatever, I had no awareness around myself or my music or whatever. So you're already starting off on a on a a good uh, a good start. Um, what I'll say is like for for platforms, there's a bunch of different routes you can go. Of course. Um, I would stick to the main ones. You know, you got YouTube, Instagram, TikTok is huge. I don't do a lot of TikTok, but you being a guitar player, I see a lot of guitar and music production content on TikTok that you could definitely make. So that's making like some short form videos that can either be informative or entertaining. I think actually that is the formula for you for all of the content, right? Informative or entertaining. So your music, if you wanted to do like a live session, maybe you even just play guitar over one of your beats that already exists. That's like entertainment. I can imagine somebody watching a, a long form video, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes, and it's your beats playing and you're able to just play, you know, guitar over those beats. Like it's basically the chill hop stations, but it's you playing guitar live. I think people would be super into that. That's entertaining. You could do short form versions of those. So maybe like 30, 15, 30 second, one minute, three minute versions of those two. That's all entertainment content because you make music, you're an entertainer. Then in informative content, share your skills. Like the same thing that you see me doing here on this channel with t tutorials and stuff. Um, people would love once they hear your music and are entertained by your music. There are a lot of aspiring lo-fi producers that probably want to learn from you and probably want to recreate something that you want to uh, that um, is similar to what you create. So sharing that knowledge and building a connection to a community that way, same blueprint that I do here on this channel is a great avenue for you. Whether And you have the, the unique skills of like guitar, very specific on the lo-fi, um, getting all that out there that way. So informing the audience, doing education, and then connecting with the community, and then also releasing some entertainment stuff, you performing, um, dynamic videos of like you and your music, that kind of thing. I think that is a no brainer. Awesome. And wow. as you do that, I think that's the formula, right? But pay attention to each platform. So like what length and style videos do well on YouTube is not the same thing as the length and style videos that do well on TikTok. So just pay close attention to formatting. Cause I think you have, you have the information and you have the entertainment value. Now just figure out the packages you're going to put that in and maybe just focus on one of those to start or a couple of those, whatever you have capacity for. Um, but your the skills that you're probably going to have to build are visual content. How do I capture this in a, a high quality way? Um, how do I format it? How do I edit it? So you're, you're on a new level of skill building. You've built up these skills in lo-fi and music production, et cetera. Um, you might have to do a little bit of skill building depending on what skills you already have in terms of, uh, you know, making videos and making media. Mm -hmm. wow, that's awesome that's so helpful uh, and don't sleep on photo content either like your instagram you could like have a lot more followers on instagram take lots of photos tag brands hashtags all that good stuff make sure you're doing all that sure okay. awesome wow. actually i just i my signs so, sound surprising i've just been producing for like six months now but uh that's amazing 
and I'm like, uh, now that I kind of like my music where it's at now, I'm like, it's kind of too, it's time to develop my brand, you know? And you know, it will grow over time and your style and your sound will evolve over time. Um, but that said, like for all the people out there, like who are familiar with SDK's music and hear like, oh, he's only been producing for six months. Like everybody's journey is different, you know, like. I'm sure LeBron James was born with like this natural basketball talent, you know, and you, oh, yeah. I mean, and, uh, music is not new for me because I've been right. playing since eight years old and I'm 21 now, but I just decided to take producing seriously just as of recently. And that's an important note too, because if you, that, uh, thank you for sharing that because having that solid foundation, being involved in music since you were so young that's important for people to know too because once you do start making this content you're going to have a lot of people that show up to the channel and say like well how do i do this and it's easy to say well you play this chord you play this chord or you put this reverb on the track or whatever but really like the actual the actual answer to that is spend you know over the last decade of your life learning music and then spend six months focusing on how to make beats, you know, like that's the reality of the answer. But how do you catch people up to speed based on that? You know? Wow. man, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Uh, like I said, your music is great. I, if you start sharing your journey, I would love to kind of like, uh, um, boost with my platform as much as possible. So keep us posted, keep us updated with how, how that goes. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate you, man. Thanks so much, man. I, I'll I'll look forward to listening to some more of your music and seeing you on a future live stream. For sure, I'll be here. Have a good one. You as well. Thank you. Uh, great call, great call. Um, Mutant Panda has joined as a member. Welcome, the Mutant Panda, as a VIP. If you're looking for that free sample pack VIPs, make sure you check the community tab. Community tab is where I post two members, so you got to make sure you check that. YouTube does not always alert people. To when I post. People are amped for um, Samuel's segment. So let's get it going. Let's do this. You guys really like the call-in shows, huh? It seems like call-in shows are popular. Do you prefer call-in shows or interview shows? That's what I want to know. Hi, Kirky. Welcome. Hello, Samuel. Oh, I forgot to do the intro. Darn. Um, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. every oh, I got to do the intro. See you. Here we go. This is my segment, Samuel Says. Welcome, Samuel. All right, that, that was a flubbed intro, but all right, good enough. What's up, Samuel? How are you doing? I'm doing good. Very tired because school started. Um, Yeah. Up mad early to catch the bus. Yeah, no, I, I actually almost missed the bus today. I had to run out the house. Classic. Classic Samuel. <laughs> Either um, is. Anyways, what's going on? It's good. I need to learn how to download samples now. Because like all the websites I used to use, they're so sketchy. Yes, like, all of the free sample websites and the free plugin websites, they're all sketchy. That's why I like I have mean, no interest in participating in that culture. People ask me all the time, free samples, free VSTs, free whatever. No, as soon as you type in free whatever into Google, you get brought to all these crazy sketchy sites. Yeah. But I mean like, eh, either is. Yeah, so about those. Um I like I literally do not know how to get samples other than Splice. But, like uh, are you using Splice? No. Well, it came, my launch key came with a two month free splice trial. Good. So like I could try that, but you should try that. You haven't even taken advantage of it yet. It's not complicated. You download splice and then you browse the samples and then you push download. Do you watch my stream, Samuel? Samuel, you're in all my content and you see me open splice from the top of my screen yeah, and yeah, drag samples in. Pop up in the corner. Why are you saying it's complicated? Yeah, but like downloading it and all, and this is my problem with free, like, Pause, pause. Plugins. What is the confusing part about downloading samples? It's not confusing. It's just You said like, it was confusing. It's annoying after the trial's over. No, because you actually get to um uh LOL Natalie Messiah in the chat says you almost missed the bus, Sam. Uh oh. <laughs> You're in <laughs> trouble. Um, back to that. What do you mean once the trial's over? You get to keep the samples. Doesn't matter. Wait, do you keep the samples after the trial's over? This, yes, the samples download to your computer. They're yours. Okay. 
that cleared up a bit of confusion. Got it. Either way, with trial plugins, I feel like every time I download one, they just stay in my plugin folder and like it's kind of annoying. It just clutters up space. Um, yes, that's why I just like. For example, I go ahead. Sorry, you go ahead. No, I was gonna say I'm in this weird spot of getting a lot for free. But even before I did not get a lot for free, like I was super focused. Like I was like, if I'm gonna buy a plugin, I'm gonna buy. If I'm gonna want a plugin, I buy that plugin and I use that plugin. I'm not trying a bunch of different free things. Like I guess you can like try trying a bunch of things is valuable. But like you can also watch a bunch of YouTube videos on a bunch of synths. And I know you're probably trying to get the most out of whatever free stuff you can. But like, and you are only 14. So like the idea of investing in your craft, whatever, like however you're able to save or, you know, make money for whatever, start thinking of it that way. Like you got to start investing in your craft and invest, invest in something like one thing that you're going to be able to, you know, get a lot of use out of, whether that's a serum or an analog lab or whatever. That way you're not dealing with this because every every second you spend dealing with like annoying file management or like free trials, taking up hard drive space or like, you know, browsing on sketchy sites for free samples. Like that's all time yeah, taken away. It kills the vibe and it, it eliminates your like uh, motivation. And then it also just takes your time. So. And yeah, like fully. when I was also your age, like I was not using a lot of like external stuff. Like if you have. um since you have Ableton, like there's a lot of built-in stuff there that you could be using. So don't um don't get caught up in the flashy stuff that you see a lot of producers using. Pay attention to like how can you do as much as possible with what already comes with the software, you know? Okay. Good to know. I just discovered Ableton sound packs a few days ago. Like I always knew they existed, but I always thought they were like samples. Like no, yeah, there's files. a lot of there's a lot of um straight up instruments like and there's a lot of free ones too. Hopefully you've discovered that. But for people who don't know, like you can go to Ableton's site and go to packs and sort by free. And there's a lot of very cool free packs. Like some of my favorite packs are free from Ableton. Now to the body of the the talk. Let's do Copyright. it. Copyright. Copyright. Like. I don't it's care so about controversial. it. Controversial. It's not controversial. There's it's, no one answer. There's no one answer. It's overcomplicated. Here's the one thing that I know for certain is 100% true. As soon as you make a piece of art, you own the copyright for it. You don't have to go through any government body. You don't have to file any paperwork. The second you make something, a track, a doodle on a piece of paper, um, uh, whatever it may be, as soon as you make something, you own the copyright for it. So... I think I know where the, like the line of questioning is going. What a lot of amateur producers get caught up in is, oh, before I release my music, I have to copyright it. And also copywriting costs money. Like the official copywriting costs money. So what people do is they never end up releasing tracks or they release tracks way less than they ever would because before they upload to SoundCloud or put it on Spotify or whatever, they go, oh, I have to, I have to copyright it. Songwriters do this too, especially in the songwriting world. But here's what happens. As soon as you upload your track to uh, Spotify, to SoundCloud, to YouTube, wherever it might go, what happens? It has a release date on it, right? And if you yeah. really did create that song, meaning that you do own the copyright for it, regardless of any paperwork, regardless of any anything, if somebody comes out with a song after that date that sounds that, that you could make a case for, that is completely ripped off from your song, then you have a valid um, um, valid reason to pursue a lawsuit. That also said, I think a lot of amateur producers are in this headspace that anybody in the world would possibly steal their music. Like if you're a just starting out music producer, the chances of somebody finding your work and completely ripping it off in a way that could even be um, sorted out through litigation are slim to none. So what ultimately happens is you have this 0.0001% chance that your work is somehow going to get quote unquote stolen. Um, and then people get caught up in this system of copyright. Got to copyright my music. Got to pay this money. Got to do this big complicated process. Um, and then it hinders them from releasing music. So at the end of the day, it's just not worth the hassle or the process. Eventually, maybe one day when you have more time or you have more capacity or it makes more sense, you have a little more attention, it might make sense. But for any anybody 
I don't do it. So like anybody m- below my level, I would not recommend it. I just don't, I just don't understand. There's so much gatekeeping in music. And that's one of these, it's, it's, it's a structure of the old music industry. It's a structure of the industry and it's gatekeeping. It's like, oh, don't release this until you have the copyright. You have to do this. You have to, you know, even what we were talking about before, you have to form an LLC if you want to do X, Y, Z, like it's whatever, like you own the copyright as soon as you make something. Um, what was your question? I don't think I allowed you to ask the question, but go ahead. Wait, which, oh, okay. So um, I was wondering, like, because Daltrick does a lot of, I mean, she recreates a lot of songs, and I heard her talk about copyright in one of her streams. Um, so, like, what are the restrictions about, for example, like pitch and tempo and stuff? And does that matter in, like, getting copyright strikes? You can't copyright a chord progression. Um, you definitely... So look at any famous copyright case. I'm trying to think of some of the most famous ones. There's one Ed it's Sheeran one. Katy Perry one. and yeah, well, another guy one. Who is it? Katy Perry and there's one with Robin Thicke as well. Look at those cases. Those, so those are very big high level cases, right? Um, and what ultimately happens is you have to prove so many points of like commonality. And not only that, but these lawsuits take so much time and effort. And money. So let's say like you, I don't know. It's just very hard to prove unless you're straight up ripping off. So many things have to come together. You have to rip off the melody and the feel has to be the same. Basically what it comes down to is does it create market confusion? So if I, if Samuel Messiah puts out a track and it sounds exactly like Ed Sheeran's shape of you, if it sounds close enough that it creates market confusion, like is this Ed Sheeran or is this Samuel Messiah, then there's a strong case for copyright infringement. If you can make again a case against market confusion, then it's not it's not happening. So it, like there's no lawsuit. And the uh, the idea that somebody would sue, like you just don't have to worry about, about getting sued if you're at a lo- lower level. Unless you're super rich, don't worry about getting sued because you'll get a cease and desist if you cross the line. You can decide whether or not you want to fight that cease and desist. Um, but the chances of you even crossing the line and it even being on somebody's radar are so, so slim. And you mentioned Daltrick. Like, yeah, covers are a totally different story. Like, that's, that has nothing to do with copyright infringement um, because you can cover somebody's song and credit them. If Daltrick covered a song and said, oh, I wrote it, like, that would be another thing. Nobody does that, though. It comes down... The only change there, if I do a cover on YouTube or like even I'm sure this happens for some adult trick stuff, too, is like it gets monetized by the copyright holder. So let's say if I cover a song by the 1975, I put it up on YouTube. It immediately gets claimed. I'm not in any trouble. The only thing that happens is the ads that run on that video. All the revenue will go to the original artist or even sometimes they split the revenue 50 50 so 50 percent goes to the artist and they leave 50 percent to the uh, cover artist so that's the thing i just think it's a non-issue oh, for most producers it is a non-issue don't rip off somebody else's music um as long as you don't do that you're safe if something is like a little bit close it's not that serious keep making what you're making and like um don't spend your time thinking about this just be a good person. Don't rip off other people's work and you'll be fine. It's a non-issue for most people. I thought it was people. way more complicated than that. No, because copyright law is way more complicated than what I just talked about. However, the way it affects musicians, especially at a lower level, is so negligible that it doesn't matter and it's not worth getting into talking about the nuances of the law. And once you are at a level where it matters, you have lawyers and management and people that take care of this stuff for you. So there's so much stuff like that in the music industry where shit doesn't matter, where stuff doesn't matter until um, you um, get to a certain level. By the time you're at that level, you have the resources to put towards it where you don't have to worry about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So much stuff like that. So if you ever get com- like caught up in the complications of like music industry, like ask yourself if it's that sort of s- scenario. Because I hear that all the time and people just hold themselves back because they're like, oh, but I didn't copyright it. So what do I do? Like, just put it out. Like, look at what everybody else is doing. Like, do you think every Instagram beat maker, every song writer you see on the Internet is going and copywriting every single one of their songs? No, nobody would ever put out any music because they'd be spending all their time filling out paperwork and paying $50 for whatever song, you know? That's what I think. Yeah. 
copyright. It's complicated. Okay, let's just go to the last question because I know there's one more call. Take it away. So, there's two more calls. All right. Okay. So why do you need to say that a video is sponsored when you release it? Like, are you forced by YouTube to, to say that it's sponsored? Yes. So that's part of the law. Um, I don't really care about the law. <laughs> LOL. Natalie Messiah says, Sam, go to sleep. <laughs> I love that. We love we love Natalie. Have Natalie call in one of these days. We'll have the whole the whole family on. Anyway, yes, it's required by law. It's an FTC requirement. However, even if there was not an FTC requirement, I got into an argument with this about somebody with somebody on Twitter the other day. They were trying to say that um, even fr they were trying to say if you receive free gear, you don't have to disclose it. Which there is a gray area in the law, right? Roly sends me the seaboard block. They don't pay me to make a video, but they sent me the seaboard block and I make a video. Do I have to tell you that they sent me the seaboard block? No. Is it better for you as an audience to make an assessment based on my what I do to say like, okay, I'm going to view this review through the lens of Roly gifted him this thing and he's making a piece of content with it. Could that affect the opinion? Maybe, maybe not. I'll tell you that it does not affect my opinion or the content that I'll make with it, but that's for you to decide like my legitimacy. So beyond just the law, yes, it is. If you get paid to make a piece of content, you get a sponsor. It has to say it in the description of the video. It has, you have to state that in the video. That's the law. The other thing is you need to be every artist out there that makes content. And if you get sponsors, like you need to just be a good person and for your own integrity and for the safety of your audience, disclose everything. There's no use in hiding anything from your audience. Yes, this person paid me to make a video. Yes, this person sent me a free piece of gear. And if there's artists, I, I know for a fact that there's bigger name artists out there that are doing sponsored posts that are not being disclosed in their posts. And I don't call it out, but it's happening. So just pay close attention. If, if people are using like straight up brand language in their posts, in their description, in their, um, whatever you call it, their caption, like it's pretty obvious. And if it doesn't say this is a sponsor, that's kind of against the law. And that's kind of, they're hiding something from you because they want you to think they're doing a totally thi uh, a thing from their own heart. And Samuel got me going on this one. A brand that has gifted me gear before and I've done videos with before reached out to sponsor some content to pay me money. And then when it came down to make the content and I explained to them how the disclosure works, I'll state it at the top of the video and then I'll put a, just a little note in the description. They said, we would rather have content come from the heart. So we do want to pay you for the video, but we'd rather have content that quote unquote comes from the heart. So if you could make the video, but not disclose that it's a sponsorship, um, that would be great. And I didn't do the deal and I passed up on money because that's not right for the audience. Like that's such BS. And that brand is lucky that I'm not putting them on blast right now because that is absurd. So not only that, but it puts that brand on blast and I see everybody else who makes content with that brand. And I say, Hmm, I wonder how much they got paid for this and they're not disclosing. So it's all messed up. And there's a lot of people out there that are trying to like pretend it's one way and and act like they're not getting sponsored, but they're getting sponsored. Especially another thing to to look out for is if you see a lot of creators posting about the same thing, um, even two, more than two creators posting about um, like the same plugin or the same piece of gear. And you know, of course it's like something might get released and a lot of people might make content with it. But if all of a sudden a couple of big time creators start posting about some vocal plugin and they're not saying anything about it being sponsored, it's a little sus. You know, um, so for me to be a good person and to be honest with you all as my viewers in this community, and I hold my community in very high regard and I hold integrity as one of my very big main values, I don't cross that line. And even if it wasn't a law, I would fully disclose every single thing. And there are a lot of creators out there that do not. So you should all um, protect yourself and try to peel back the curtain on what people are doing a little bit. Patreon rants. Tatro rants. Like there should be a Tatro rant segment. Um, I think that is your segment. I think the Samuel says segment is the Tatro rant segment because you get me going on so many things. Sure, we can actually convert it to Tatro rants. Yeah, for sure. Maybe one day. All right. Um, Natalie says you have to go to bed. Yeah, I'm very sleepy. Yeah. Very tired. Well, have a good <laughs> evening and have a good day at school tomorrow. Get up on time so you can catch the bus. 
Victor. Thank you for the call. Thank you for your call. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Um, guys, I'm just noticing in the chat really quick. Um, lots of good conversation happening in the chat, and I haven't really noticed anybody spamming. So please let Joseph McCaffrey and myself police the chat. Don't call people out for spamming. I don't see anything wrong with what anybody is saying in chat. Um, and we'll kind of police it. You know, it's fine. People are keeping up with the conversation. Two more calls for you. I got June Bernie up next. June Bernie. Who I see in the chat as well. Uh, da -da 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 -da. June. Oh, almost. Just got to unmute yourself. This has been a great show, my friends. Thank you all. There we are. Oh, hello, hello. June. Hi, uh, long time viewer. First time calling in. Amazing. Thank you for both. Um, what is, uh, where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Seattle. Amazing. How is Seattle? I've never visited, but it seems like an appealing place. Uh, it's a nice place. It's a very laid back uh, environment. Uh, if you've been to any West Coast city, you've experienced the vibe of Seattle. Got it. But it's like cloudy and rainy, right? Like I think twilight. Yeah. Well, the, the joke I like to make is that in Seattle, it's not always raining, but it's always about to rain. Got it. Yeah, I hear that for sure. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to ask you about, uh, I'm a teacher primarily. Uh, Thank you for that. I, I do my best, yeah. <laughs> uh, I teach guitar and songwriting and production. Amazing. And stuff like that. Uh, currently working through a third party, uh, I guess, lessons yeah. company, whatever. Um, and I'm looking to diversify my income sure. uh, and eventually get to a place where I'm standing on my own two feet. And I am very invested in the educational space, but I'm also invested in artistic output and artistic, um, whatever expression. Uh, so I was wondering if you had any, uh, insight on actually making money with your music as opposed to um sample packs which i also do i sell sample packs yep um and uh, i got a patreon and all that kind of stuff uh but uh just making money with the actual music music right well let's play this out i don't have good news for you um <laughs> the thing about it is who are the most who are the artists that you think are making the most money on their music right now the taylor swifts of the world the Phoebe Bridgers of the world, the big name major label artists, right? And that's because of the way the streaming services are set up. So basically, how do people consume music? Let's start there. They stream it. They either stream it through Apple Music, Spotify, very few people buying physical um, albums, whatever format that may be. So the way that those structures work is when I pay my subscription fee every month, money goes... It, it, they disperse out the money to artists, but they don't do it. Like, even if I was, if, I, if I'm a non major label artist, right. Even if I got like a million streams to tomorrow, I'm not getting the same amount of money that Taylor Swift gets for her, a million streams. It's disproportionately distributed amongst bigger artists, you know? Right. So big mm -hmm. artists get are at the top, they get the most, and then it funnels down to smaller and smaller, and smaller artists. So that, is so one way to make m money with your music is to get signed to a major label for most of us i'm super not uh, a major label deal does not appeal to me that was actually another thing i wanted to ask you about was labels yeah uh, I have um, some about them. unless a label could offer me something that i could not accomplish on my own and the deal was good i don't really have a lot of interest i'm doing just fine with my own independent thing that said, good transition into the independent thing. So you say you have a Patreon, you do some sample packs, etc. How do you get people to listen and care about your music when there are millions? Music making is more accessible than ever because of people like you who teach and then online resources that are easily accessible and the tools are even more accessible. So, so many people can make music. How do you get people to even care about your music in a sea of a bunch of other music? You could make the best music in the world, but excuse me, unless an artist has a, um, unless a community or a fandom or, uh, people have a connection to you as an artist, what's going to get people to listen to your music, you know? So that's mm -hmm. why the biggest thing for me is community, community, community is like building up through social platforms. And I know that sounds like, okay, well, you're not making money from music. You're making money from your 
community and, and like making social media stuff. But at the end of the day, like how else do you build a fandom these days? Like you got to do something. You got to put stuff out there so that like, okay, maybe I have this nice subscribership. Now, every time I release music, the more subscribers I have, the more people I can tell that I just released a bunch of music and the more people that will see that link. And that's the more people that will potentially click that link, you know? So that's what audience building does. Um, I had another point there, but maybe we can just continue the conversation. I'll find my way back to it. But yeah. The, so are, are you saying it's more of a, this is more of a social media game than it is a. Um... Social media tactically. Yes, but it's still, um, you still have to make great music and it's not, not necessarily social media specifically. That's the tactic, but the, the game is community building and building a relationship with an audience. Cause what do, what do those major label artists have? They have the resources to get a documentary out, the resources to promote an album with tons of video and photo content. They have earned media. They can do the article in Ro Rolling Stone. They can do the L magazine shoot. They can have the interview across different social media. Um, they have that machine behind them to reach a broader audience, which allows them to connect with a broader, with a, you know, funnel that down. Not everybody who sees the video or reads the article or whatever is going to become a fan. But when you cast that wide of a net, the amount of people that funnel down into becoming fans is a lot higher than if you have a much smaller net, you know? So like the only way we can do that for ourselves is like independent artists is putting in the work and sharing value and being entertaining and building up this online audience. I mean, at least that's my answer for it. I know a lot of people, um, you know, there's lots of creative ways to stand out online, but I, I really feel like in this new music industry, it really is about community building because so many people are out here trying to do it. Like the only thing that separates me from any other artist, like SDK, who called in earlier, he's a great lo-fi beat maker. Like his music is so great. It's probably better than mine. And the only reason that I have a bigger audience is because... Um, you know, like I've built it up over time. I've built community around it, you know, like that's the, that's the Delta there, even though his music is fantastic and people should listen. The, the point that I was going to bring up too about music is like getting playlisted. I mean, that's the only kind of way in for independent artists. If you, even if you have none of that social media stuff, right? If you are making music regularly and you think it will fit super well on a playlist, or maybe you're making music to specifically target a, a playlist, then submitting to playlists and getting attention that way, that's how people discover new music and people might discover your song and it might take off. But what's the best case scenario, right? You get a million plays on a song and it pays you maybe three grand, you know, like, that's great. Like three grand is great with peace and love, but like, that's not a sustainable model. You have to put out a song, hope that it gets a decent amount, enough plays to make a significant amount of money. Hope that it gets put into a playlist, you know, like there's so many ifs, ifs, ifs. Meanwhile, if you put a work in with a community, everybody in this chat, you who are, you're, everybody who called in, like I have this community to rely on, you know, Th that's mm -hmm. just my spiel of like, Yes, it would be great if we lived in a world where I could drop some music. If we went back to 1990 and I could put out an album and I could sell it at Walmart, it's a 10 track album and sell it at Walmart for $20, you know, that would be great if we existed in that industry. But would it be great? Because the reason that that happened was because the labels were all in control. The industry was very, was even more gate kept than it is now. Nobody had the tools to record to make their own music at home. Like making music was so much less accessible. Learning about music and especially music production was so much less accessible. So would I want to go back to the 90s when music was maybe higher valued, but it was a little more scarce and it was a little harder to get into the industry? I don't think I would. I think I like this a lot better. It's just a little bit harder to get heard and, and get on top of, uh, get, get through the noise, you know? Nice. I, maybe oh. that's not the easiest, like, I know that's not the, like, here's how you make money with just making music, but, like, that's just not the game we're playing anymore, you know? No, yeah, I actually really appreciate that answer because it kind of affirms me that I'm on the right path. For sure. Because <laughs> that, that seems like what I've been doing in a way, or at least making an attempt to. Yeah. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and folks can always look to the artists that they like the most. I think a lot of artists that people 
would call themselves like, oh, they're my favorite artist or like I whatever. Whoever they are, it's likely that you have some kind of connection to them beyond just their music. Like maybe one song hooked you in, but then maybe that one song led you to go follow them on Instagram or watch their vlog or read an interview. And suddenly you're a fan of the person, not just the song, you know, and that's so much more valuable than the song because then you can release anything and people will listen to it because they like you. You know what I mean? And as you're an artist and as your sound grows and as you grow and change as a person, your sound naturally grows with you. So um, having that fandom that's there for you, not just there for that one song that you put out is a lot like healthier and more sustainable. Nice. Yeah, I, re I really appreciate that answer. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for calling in, June. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, have a good one. Call in again soon. I'll, I'll do my best. All right. Have a good one. Uh, some great calls today, chat. That's it. I thought we had two more, but we only had that last one. Thank you to everybody who called in today. This is a fantastic stream. I had a lot of fun. It seems like you all enjoy the call-in streams. And if you do enjoy them, we can continue to do them. Um, a lot of good chat in the... Um, text chat as well. So I'm sorry if I didn't get to all questions. If you do have music making related questions, I will be live again today in about seven hours. So at 7 p.m. I'll be going live tonight, making some music, making some beats, taking questions. I'm chatting in chat a little bit more. It should be a fun chill stream. We haven't had just a good chill music making stream. I'll work in live 11. Maybe I'll, f I'll find a plugin I want to focus on tonight, but I'll put the pre-stream up in about an hour. Make sure you have notifications turned on so that when I put that up, you get the notification. Uh, you should scribe all that stuff. Um, J Star Beats, nobody can acquire the copyright to your music after you've created it. You own the copyright as soon as you create it. You should go back and rewatch that segment that I did with Samuel. But yeah, this was a lot of a um, lot of lessons. If you tuned in late, please go back and watch from the beginning because there's a lot of value to be had. This is a really good. This is one of the strongest call-in shows we've had. Seems like this topic was very interesting. If you have ideas for future topics, I would love to hear them in the comments or in the chat. Um, please let me know. Live every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Make sure you tune in for tonight's live stream at 7 p.m. PST. I would love to have you all here on my Tuesday night live stream when we chill we make some music so that'd be great 343 labs this show is brought to you by 343 labs the link is in the description it's an electronic music school based in new york berlin and online so if you're interested in taking classes that are more affordable than a university and more in depth with more knowledgeable instructors than a college i would say um people that have actual music industry experience you should consider taking a class with 343 labs and if you want to know more about the instructors, the instructors are streaming live every day, youtube.com slash 343labs. So subscribe to that channel. I do a lot with that channel and put a lot of effort into that channel as well. So if you all could help me grow that subscriber number, I would love to get 343labs to 9,000 subscribers. We're very, very close. So if all of you, after you close out of this stream, just open up youtube.com slash 343labs. Hit the subscribe button. You won't be disappointed. Lots of cool music production content there. But that's going to be it. I will see you all tonight at 7 p.m. PST. So thank you all so much for watching. Thank you to all the new members. Um, this has been Tatro. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.